Hello, my name is Jeremy McCandless, and welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. You know, when Jesus walked the earth, his authority was often a matter of great contention, particularly among the religious leaders of his time. This questioning of his authority is evident both at the beginning and at the end of his ministry. From the very outset, people noted that Jesus spoke with a unique authority, unlike the other rabbis of his time, who would typically support their teachings by citing other authorities. Jesus, differently when he spoke, he possessed an inherent authority. He often actually prefigured what he said with the phrase, I say unto you, rather than the usual, it is written. The climax of this challenge to Jesus' authority occurs during this final week of his life, beginning here, I believe, with what follows on from his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where he'd actually been hailed as the Messiah by the crowds. We saw in yesterday's episode that Jesus went into the temple and overturned the tables of the Monday changers, and it was at this moment that religious leaders questioned his authority, likely because they were, well, perplexed, challenged by these audacious actions to do this. This challenge prompts us, I believe, to explore the source and nature of Jesus' authority. Now, in its own like this, it's a topic rarely discussed. I'm not sure I've heard a sermon preached on it. It's just assumed that Jesus had inherent authority. But as I've worked through the Gospel of Luke, well, as we've worked through the Gospel of Luke together systematically over these last, what, three months is it now? I've encountered this passage and I realize because of what has gone before, I felt compelled to investigate further. And in doing so, I believe I've uncovered some intrinsic insights that I believe are worth sharing and a useful way in which we can frame them. And that's what I'd like to do today. So welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Okay, let's jump into Luke chapter 20, where we find the challenge to Jesus' authority, and it begins right at the beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read the complete text for you. It's in two main parts, and then I'll work through those two main parts, verse by verse, before trying to wrap it all up at the end. So we're we going to begin at verse 1, initially reading verse 1 to 8, where we see the authority of Jesus questioned. And it says this, One day as Jesus was teaching in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, scribes it says in some translations, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, Well, I will ask you a question first. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or human origin? Now this is John the Baptist he's talking about here. Continuing verse 5, they discussed it among themselves and said, "Hmm, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why don't you believe in him? Meaning John the Baptist and what he taught. But if you say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was indeed a prophet. So they answered, we don't know where it came from. Then Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And the second half of today's passage, Jesus follows on with this, what is called the parable of the tenants. Picking up at verse 9, it says, He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenant farmers so that they could give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. 
But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus then looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone upon whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Okay, that's the text, friends. Now, the backdrop to this event is Jesus' recent cleansing of the temple. As discussed yesterday, this event likely occurred during the last week, the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Experts would say it probably happened on the Tuesday. Now, on this particular day, Jesus was teaching and preaching in the temple, delivering the good news and possibly even teaching more about the kingdom to come. And what we see here is a formal committee from the Sanhedrin, who of course is the supreme ruling body in Israel, comprising chief priests, scribes and elders. And they confront Jesus and they pose a crucial critical question. They ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority? Now the question is aimed to discern the nature and the source of the authority that Jesus claimed for doing these dramatic things. If he claimed human authority, it would likely provoke the people. If he claimed divine authority, it would have been seen as blasphemous by them anyway. So the religious leaders thought they had trapped Jesus by posing this question. However, Jesus responds very cleverly by posing a question in return. And he asks them about the baptism of John the Baptist. And he says, was that from heaven or was that from the imagination of a man, so to speak? Now, this question puts the religious leaders in a real quandary. They realize that whatever answer they give to this question, they're caught in a dilemma. If they acknowledge John's baptism as of heavenly origin, as divine, they would be compelled to accept Jesus' authority on the spot. But if they deny it, they risk angering the vast majority of people who regarded John as a prophet. So faced with this dilemma, the religious leaders retreat, admitting, we don't know the answer to that question. Now, that's the correct response, by the way. Sometimes it's okay to say you don't know, friends. Anyway, the response that they give shows, demonstrates Jesus' skill in navigating the challenging situation and question they brought to him. And also, I would suggest, reveals that in tricky situations, we see him revealing the limitations of human wisdom in the face of divine authority. So that's the opening section. And immediately following on from this, Jesus teaches a parable to throw a deeper, broader, more nuanced, multi-level interpretation of what's really going on here. And in the parable, he says, a certain man. Now, that Bible experts would say that man in this parable represents God. And it tells us he plants a vineyard, which represents the nation of Israel. And he leases it to the vine dressers, which represents the authoritative figures in the nation of Israel's religious history, which at this point, of course, they see themselves in that role as the religious leaders. The owner, it says, sends servants to collect the fruit of the vineyard, symbolizing the fruit, symbolizing the payment due to him for what the blessings he and resources he had provided for them. However, what it says is those vine dressers mistreat and beat each servant he sends to them, ultimately casting them all out empty handed. The mistreatment escalates with each servant that is sent, indicating the worsening response of the vine dressers as time goes on. They not only refuse to give the fruit that they were meant to give, being subject as servants to this man, but their increasingly severe treatment actually culminates in an action of violence and expulsion. So the parable highlights metaphorically 
the rejection and mistreatment of God's messengers pretty much through all of Israel's history, symbolized by the servant in the story. It's meant to serve as a warning, a warning against the religious leaders, their hardness of heart and their failure to fulfill their responsibilities, both towards God and towards God's people. Now, the religious leaders in the crowd hearing this parable immediately recognize themselves in it. They know it's being directed at them and they understand the implications of what it means for their own behavior and in terms of their own accountability one day before God. But their response is to become even more incensed. They realize that Jesus is exposing their failure and the potential for an impending judgment. So this parable again underscores Jesus' authority, both as a teacher and he's linking himself with the prophets who came before. And of course he's courageously here confronting those in power with the truth. Maybe the, one of the first examples in history of telling truth to power. And Jesus' use of this parable is of course quite brilliant as it convicts on multiple levels what indeed the Sanhedrin was doing and the layers of meaning of what's really going on here. By emphasizing that the owner sent his own beloved son, Jesus is again highlighting his own divine authority and his relationship with God the Father. Now the religious leaders, remember these guys are very well versed in scripture and they would have absolutely understood the implication of what's going on here. The vine dressers in the parable, decision to kill the owner's sons, represents the ultimate rejection of God's authority and the culmination of Israel's disobedience throughout history, leading to this point, initially the rejection of the prophets sent by God, all of God's messengers, but leading to this point where they're going to reject, well, go way beyond that with the Son of God, who's the Messiah who's standing before them. And Jesus here actually prophesies that as a result of their rejection they're going to kill the son and the vineyard representing God's kingdom and his blessings will actually be taken away from those who have it from Israel and given to others and this will be removed from Israel and widened out given to others and this of course foreshadows the expansion of God's kingdom to include the Gentiles signifying a shift in the recipients of God's blessing from a select group to potentially everyone. Now by quoting Psalm 118, specifically verse 22, which says the stone the builders rejected does become the cornerstone, Jesus not only identifies himself as the rejected Messiah, but it also implies that his rejection by the religious leaders is actually part of God's plan for salvation for the world. The stone that was rejected, that's Jesus, will become the cornerstone of God's new work on earth, symbolizing the central role of Christ in God's redemptive plan for humanity. Overall, this parable serves as a powerful indictment against the religious leaders of Israel on that day. Of course, it reveals the hardness of their heart and their failure to recognize him and accept him as the promised Messiah. But it also foreshadows the expansion of God's kingdom to include people like you and me, friends. People from all nations and all backgrounds, emphasizing the universal, all-encompassing scope of God's salvation plan. He then adds in verse 18 by saying, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and anyone upon whom it falls will be crushed. And again, he's alluding to two passages of scripture. He's referring to Isaiah chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 2, where the stone is again used as a metaphor for the Messiah. Now there are two different images going on here. One is something that they stumble over, they reject, they stumble over it. But in Daniel 2, the stone becomes the very thing that grinds on them, falls on them and destroys them. And that's the point. So what he's saying here is, yes, some will reject the stone. In fact, it will become the thing that trips them up. They'll stumble over it when confronted with it. And for some, it will actually fall on them and crush them. 
Now, the bottom line of this parable is that ultimately, eternally, if you reject the Son, then indeed he will, in a sense, reject you. You reject the stone, and the stone becomes the thing that convicts you and the metaphor uses of crushing you. On the other hand, of course, if you accept the Son, he will become the cornerstone upon which you can build your life, not needing to be the stone that falls and destroys you. It's a powerful metaphor, a powerful parable, isn't it, friends? Then the narrative continues in verse 19, and it says, The teachers of the law and the chief priests, in response to this, they look for a way to arrest him immediately because they know just how dangerous this parable that he has spoken against them is. The likelihood is they want to kill him. But in reality, although that's what at heart they'd like to do, they can't do that yet, not at this point anyway. It's not politically expedient for this to do that, given the situation they face. So they think, we need to talk about this. We've got to figure this all out. We're frightened of the people's reaction. They realize if they try and grab Jesus by force at this point, when he's just come in triumphantly, when he's just cleansed the temple, then they're going to have a potential riot in their hands. Because the people in reality, in the majority, have just hailed him as the Messiah. So how can they respond in that way at this moment? So that's the narrative. But then I have a, I want to talk specifically, as I said, about the authority that's going on here. Why did he do this? Well, I would suggest the point of all this, the fact that he clears the temple, is all about leading this to this point of discussion where people have to decide by whose authority Jesus does these things. So I would say that this small section of these few verses is a passage of scripture that I believe certainly, if not the main thing, one of the main things within it is it's talking about authority, the authority of Christ. And the point is that he has authority because he is the son of God. I mean, that's clearly the point, isn't it? Jesus is in fact saying to them, I have this authority and I'm going to give you a parable that's going to tell you who I am, where my authority comes from, and the consequence of, of you doing what I know you're thinking and plotting to do. So the point of all this is the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is God incarnate walking this earth, and the one who has the indwelling authority of God within him, and they reject him. And he says, if you reject him, there are going to be consequences. Now, I did say at the beginning, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon specifically on the authority of Christ, so I want to talk about the authority, and I just want to point out the very basic things about this issue, about the authority of Christ to do what he does and to be who he is. And number one, the number one thing I want to say is Jesus has authority. I'm sure all of us can agree with that, but I want to probe what that authority means when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and what is the source of authority. And I would like to suggest to you that in human terms and worldly terms, we recognize there are different times of authority. It tends to be one of three areas of life by which we gain any authority in any situation. Now, there's the authority of what I'm calling the authority of function. The authority you have because of the ability you have to do something. An easy illustration of this might be a sports coach, one who would hold a camp for young people to teach these athletes how to do the sport they've selected. And the parents are, would maybe even be willing to pay good money for they feel the coach is the one who has authority to train their kids. And the coach is in a sense saying, look, I used to do this, I know how to do this, I've been trained how to teach other people to do it, and now I'd like to teach you how to do it. And a lot of authority that we experience in life is based on the ability to perform a function for other people. You go to a lawyer because they can fulfill a function of explaining and applying the law in a situation where you need it. And you go to a car mechanic because he's the one who has the ability to fix your car. They have the authority of performing the function that you want them to perform. 
Now, there's a second type of authority, and that's probably the one we're most familiar with in life, and that is the authority of a given position. You have authority because someone has given it to you. So if someone, for instance, owns a company and they hire a manager, they delegate to the manager the authority to do all sorts of things with the company, to make decisions, even to hire and fire employees. And if the manager says you're hired, you can believe that's true because you can ask him by Hugh's authority and he says, well, it's been given to me. I've been delegated to find people for this role. And on the other side of the coin, he can also say, you're fired. And you can say, well, how can you do that to me? And he can say, I can, because I've been given authority by the owners or the board of this business. So someone can have authority because they have or have been given a position. But then I think there's another type of authority, and I'm going to call it the authority of personhood. And what I mean by that is that you have innate authority, something that was not given to you, it was not delegated to you, but it is just there, innate because of who you are. And that is the power of the authority of personhood. Now, an illustration for us easily in the UK is the fact that we now have a new king in England. And he is king, not because he's particularly brilliant. He may be, or he may not be. That's not the point. He did not gain his authority because he's got any particular skills. He did not do something. It was not even delegated to him, but he was born the son of Queen Elizabeth II. So it just is who he is. And under our current constitution, that means he has that authority, the authority of personhood. Now, I laid all of that out before you to say this. Today, we're asking the question, what type of authority did Jesus have to do what he did? What was his authority? Well, of course, first and foremost, we would say, well, he's the son of God. Now, if you read the Gospel of John, it consistently says, I do this because the Father has given me authority. So there is obviously some kind of arrangement in the Trinity where he has been given the authority to do certain things and he does it because the Father gave him that authority. It's delegated to him, it's his position, but on top of that, he also has authority over us because of what he does, his activity, his ability to do what he did which specifically in this scenario is the fact that we sit here today knowing that the action he carried out was he died for us and he paid for our sins so i submit to his authority because he has all three of the reasons of innate authority he has authority because of who he is because of the position he's held and because of what he's done so I want to say, Jesus said, I am the Son, the Son of God, and you all need to know that the Father sent his Son, and that you guys are plotting to kill me, and if you reject me in that way, then ultimately you too, my friends, are going to be rejected by the God who sent me. Now, I can't help but point out that this kind of authority stands in contrast to those who tend to appeal to have authority, to attempt to claim authority in these days, just in, as in his days. In this case, the chief priests are in the crowd and they're saying, we have authority. And they're saying, we have authority because of Moses. Moses gave the priesthood to the Levites. So we take our stance based on the authority of Moses. Also in the Sanhedrin, there are declared to be scribes, the ones who would most likely be the authority figures, and they would actually appeal to their experience or their wisdom gained throughout the years of studying the Old Testament law. But Jesus didn't have any of that. He said, I will tell you what authority I have, and it's simply, I am. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. So there you go. Jesus has ultimate authority, and that is where it comes from. Simply, I am. But that's one thing, to have authority. The second thing is, what does someone do with it? Obviously, Jesus uses it. He expresses his authority. But then the question becomes, how does he express it? 
And what does he use that authority for? And I would suggest there are three things that he uses and expresses his authority for. Would you like to know what they are? He used his authority for three things. Number one, it was to give life. That's stated in John 17, verse 2, where in his prayer he says this, and I'm going to quote, As you have given authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life. And I'm going to quote, and remember, Jesus is praying here to his Father God, and he says, as you have given me authority over all flesh, that he should have eternal life. So God gave his son all authority so he could turn around and use it to give life to people. Now, the rest of the verse is very interesting. As many as you have given him. So the point is, he's given authority over all flesh, over anyone potentially, as many as receive it, can have eternal life. Now, at one point, some of the disciples decide they're going to leave him, not the main core, but some of the hangers-on, and Jesus then asks the disciples, he turns to them and says, are you planning to leave as well? And the disciples' response is interesting for what they say to him is this, where would we go? For you have the words of life. And that's the basis of everything, isn't it? Jesus gives life, to those who trust him for eternal life. He has the authority to do that. Secondly, listen to this, Matthew 28, 18. It says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, I would say that's a pretty comprehensive form of authority, isn't it? And this is the one passage above all the others that states it very clearly. It says, I have authority over everything, heaven and earth, the universe. So what does he do with it? He takes his authority and he uses it to give life to ordinary people like you and I. And he uses his authority to issue a command. You know the command well. I've quoted it many times. The Great Commission for us as those he's called to make disciples among all nations. And how do they do that? You simply go and preach the gospel, baptize those who trust in Jesus Christ, and you teach those who are baptized. And you gather together those that you have baptized and you start to train them, to teach them. In effect, you start a church. So the authority of Jesus Christ is used to teach us ourselves to go and win other people and disciple them and teach them. And that's the command he has given to us. So the question is really, of course, if that's how he uses his authority, then the question is, do we recognize his authority in our life? Who is the one who has ultimate authority in your life? Well, I guess on a very basic level, that changes as you go through life. When you start out in life, it's your parents, isn't it? You have no choice. You're just a toddler. They're bigger than you. You pretty much have to do what they say. But then you get older, you go to school, and that authority widens, and the teachers become authority figures. But again, you've not really got any free will choice in that. But then you get to adulthood, and then if you become a Christian, a disciple, you are making the decision to decide that Jesus is now the authority in your life. So whether or not you're recognizing your authority is not, is not about just signing up to some doctoral statement that says, I believe the authority belongs to Jesus Christ. The asset test is, do you recognize the authority of Jesus Christ by doing what he says and applying it in your life? Jesus used his authority to give us life. He used that authority to issue us with a command and the life of the disciples simply means being obedient to the words, the teachings, the life, the ministry, the commands of Jesus. But then finally, he will also use that authority to judge. The third type of authority that he will express is found in John chapter 5, where he says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So we're right back where we were at the end of Luke, the passage in Luke chapter 20. And he says that if you reject him, and this is the important thing, he has the authority to reject you. So if you reject him, then Jesus is going to say, well, it actually says, I never knew you. 
Embedded in that verse is the idea of rejection. He doesn't recognize you, so he doesn't know you. I'm going to reject you. And in terms of the parable on Luke 20, that is symbolized by them stumbling over the stone that Jesus metaphorically is. The cornerstone that instead of building their life upon, falls and crushes them. There's a tale of two battleships assigned to a training squadron that had been at sea on manoeuvres in heavy weather for several days. As the story goes, the lead battleship was on course. Night fell, but visibility became poor. There was patchy fog, so the captain decided to remain on bridge, kicking an eye on all activities. Light bearing on the starboard bow, sir. Is it steady or moving, the captain called out. The lookout replied, steady, captain. Now that probably meant they were on a dangerous collision course with another ship. The captain then said, signal that ship, we're on a collision course. Advise you change 20 degrees. The signal man obeyed and another signal came back. Advise for you to change course 20 degrees. The captain said, send this message. I am battleship commander. Change your course 20 degrees immediately. The message came back. I am able seaman second class. Change your course 20 degrees. At that time, the captain became furious and he said, I am battleship. I am high ranking commander. Change your course 20 degrees. And the message came back. I am a lighthouse. Suggest you change your course 20 degrees. Well, they changed their course. You know, there are some authorities in this life that you resist at your peril. And I suggest you change your course and you submit to him because he is the one who has the ultimate authority to give his life, to save your life, but ultimately to judge your life also. Thanks for being with me today. Okay, great having you with me here today. I do really appreciate it. Do come back again tomorrow and we'll continue exactly where we left off last time. Thank you for being with me and joining me on this amazing journey together through the whole Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. This is a free Bible study series, podcast series. Everything I put out in the Bible Project Daily Podcast is in the public domain, free to you to use in whatever way you want in your own life or in the life and ministry life that you have within the community that God's placed you. If you've not been with us for a while, why not consider subscribing? It won't cost you a penny in that way. You'll always get a notification when a new episode is uploaded. I try and put a new episode Monday to Friday every week with occasional bonus episodes at the weekend. If you'd like to connect with this ministry and support this ministry, enabling it to stay free on all these platforms all around the world, can I suggest you maybe click over and visit me on Patreon. You can sign up and become part of the Patreon community. You don't have to financially commit. There is a tier which is free, but there you will have access to You'll see the inner workings of, of this ministry and you will have access to the hours and hours of extra material I put on there. All the talks I'm giving in secular environments, all of the extra stuff that I'm doing, all of that is, is there as a bonus material, as a thank you for those people who are enabling this ministry in that way. So with that said, I'll leave it there today. It's been great being with you. Thank you again. And I do trust I'll see you back here again tomorrow or whatever day suits you. Absolutely fine to do this at the pace that works for you. But with that said, I'll just remind you my name is Jeremy McCandless. You've been listening to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye for now.